Hi, I'm Catherine Wall. I work at Alpha School. Hi, I'm Suzanne Jabarian. I'm an English teacher and teacher researcher at Alpha School. Um, over the past three years, we've been engaging in um, curriculum development at Alpha School, um, and we're into our third year of that journey. Um, and as part of that process, um, the school employed a research team from within school to look at specifically the efficacy of the new curriculum and to carry out action research so that we could really understand and, and progress the curriculum um, in an evidence-based way. So over the past year, the research team, there's five researchers at Alpha, have been looking at action-based research. One area they've looked at in particular is I calculate, which is maths and IT, uh, the maths and IT department. Um, Susie, could you just tell us a little bit about what that action-based research was? So the ILEARN evaluation highlighted independent learning as a sort of a topic or an area that we really needed to improve and look at within school. The I Calculate um, Action Research project had a specific focus on metacognitive strategies. Uh, the research question was um, what impact do metacognitive strategies have on worded problem solving within year seven? So it was a very specific focus that enabled us to look at improving independent learning but through a very very specific aspect of year seven pupils mathematics learning. Uh, Susie is one of the um, research instruments in the action-based research the team decided to do uh, pupil self-assessment of their metacognitive skills. Mm -hmm. Now initially at the outset how did you um, go about gaining consent from pupils uh, and parents for that? Um, we wanted to be as transparent as possible, really, from, from the outset. So um, before any intervention took place at all, um, the researcher who was sort of responsible for that project, Catherine Scordino, she actually went into the classroom. She spent a whole lesson with her intervention classes, introducing the topic of res research, really explaining the nature of the intervention and what we were hoping to achieve. So, you know, the first step was really sort of gaining that, that respect and that mm -hmm. trust and that was um, that, that was a, a hugely important factor in, in gaining the consent. Additionally, um, we did allow pupils to opt in. So we, we followed the principles of active informed consent. We um, provided a, a 20 minutes f you know, of time within a lesson for pupils to read through a letter which described the intervention and they then were asked to, to sign to show that they consented to the intervention. Um, in terms of parents, how did you engage the parents in the process? Um, well, the, the exact same uh, principle really, active and informed. So uh, we sent a letter out to parents as well, highlighting the action research projects and really explaining what we hope to achieve from conducting the action research. Um, and I think what really helped was that we, we put a, a contact number and email on the letter so that parents could get in touch um, if they needed extra additional information. Um, so again, just really trying to be as transparent as possible to keep the lines of communication open and, and to garner trust really in the process. So Susie, you mentioned the team's decision to, at the outset, um, communicate with parents and pupils to gain that consent. Obviously consent is something that's ongoing um, and continuous throughout the action research, uh, research project. Um, how did you ensure that uh, the lines of communication were kept open throughout the action research and the pupils had a really meaningful way, if they so wished, of, of opting out. Um, that was something that was really important to us. We certainly didn't want to think that just because pupils had signed a letter mm -hmm. at the start, for example, that they were committed to, 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 to consenting, to contributing to the, to the intervention mm -hmm. throughout the, the process. Some of these interventions lasted up to six weeks mm -hmm. and we really wanted to communicate the fact that pupils could opt out at any point. And we did provide them with very meaningful opportunities to do so at every stage and certainly before any data was collected. Um, for example, um, before every single intervention lesson, mm -hmm. pupils were reminded verbally that they could opt out. Um, and we were, given, we were trying to give them as well a, a multitude of ways in which they could do that. Mm -hmm. um, we told them that if they wanted to opt out, then they could merely do it by coming to speak with um, one of the teachers 
or if they didn't feel comfortable in doing that during a lesson and if they wanted to opt out even halfway through a lesson then we wanted to make that a real possibility for them so we basically just told them that if during a lesson for any reason that they didn't want to be approached or asked questions or data gained on mm -hmm. them or their responses then they could just merely place a, a post-it note on mm -hmm. their work and that would mm -hmm. signify to the researchers who were in the classroom at the time mm -hmm. not to approach them at that particular moment so it was meaningful it was ongoing mm -hmm. and it was reinforced throughout the whole mm. process. So just to dig a little deeper then, were the pupils allowed to not do the self-assessment or was it the collection of data that was the issue? Yeah, well, we made it very, very clear to the pupils at the start that um, any of the strategies being utilised as part of the intervention formed part of normal, everyday okay. teaching and practice. Mm -hmm. So they weren't, at, at no point were the students ever being asked to do something that would be abnormal to mm -hmm. what they would experience yeah. in the classroom anyway. Um, as you know, post uh, pre and post self-assessment is, is very, very common mm -hmm. in our classrooms and pupils partake in those kinds of activities all the time. Um, so we did have to be clear in our, in our initial discussions with the pupils that um, even if they didn't want their data or any data qualitative or quantitative to be collected on them then that they would still be expected to carry out mm. these strategies and the interventions because the strategies and interventions were forming part of the teaching for that okay. particular lesson. So in um, relation to the iCalculate action research was there any other ethical issues this research team had to consider? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things I think that we had to be really aware of was mm -hmm. the distinction between um, anonymity and confidentiality. Mm -hmm. uh, within the iCalculate uh, intervention, we were looking at, um, we were only actually taking data on 12 people participants okay. who had actively gained, uh, given their consent. So it was really important to us to be able to measure their progress and development throughout the, the whole intervention. Um, so we had to communicate very clearly to pupils that we couldn't guarantee them anon anonymity, mm -hmm. um, but we could guarantee them confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So that was, I guess, a, an ethical consideration that we had to think about really quite carefully before um, undertaking the intervention and certainly both before collecting and storing any data. Okay. In terms of storage of data, how do you manage that as a team? Well, any um, well, we're very lucky to have our own room here at mm -hmm. Offer, so um, any sort of paper qualitative data such as observation schedules, etc., were kept under lock and key in the research mm -hmm. room, um, and obviously any data, um, electronic, any electronic files uh, were stored with a, an, uh, using an encrypted okay. USB. Mm -hmm.